Hi everybody, welcome back to the Tetrix RoboBench video series. This is Tim and it is WRO time. That's World Robot Olympiad in 2017. And we want to talk to you about that today because we're excited. There's a new game in town. It's called Tetrastack. And as you can see right here, I have an example of a homemade example of a uh, Tetris piece, the L piece. And we want to talk to you today about this new game and one of the, some of the challenges that you might um, need to overcome in solving this game. It's going to be exciting, and we're going to go ahead and talk about some of those. So let's talk first about the idea of the game. The idea is that you're going to have these Tetris pieces, these, um, and there'll be all the, the five shapes um, in different colors, I think seven all total. And what the robot will have to do is pick these up, go to a board that is at a slight angle, and actually place these in the board just like you did in the game, the video game, where you line them up. And if you complete a row of pieces, then you score points. Every piece goes on the board, scores a point. Every line completed scores bonus points. So that's the basic idea. So when you think about that, there's some basic challenges with that. Number one, I have to actually pick the piece up. I have to find it, locate it, pick it up. I have to orient it because it could be in this position. It could be in this position, maybe. I have to decide how I'm going to pick that up. I have to take it to the board. I have to navigate to the board. I have to actually place it on the board in the right position. I, like if my board is long here, I might need to place it here, here, or here. And I might have to decide that it is in a certain position in any one of those places. So I have to orient to the board. I have to navigate along the distance of the board. And I have to be able to successfully place the piece, go back and pick up another one. So that's the basic challenges. So there's, we're going to talk about some of the mechanical needs that you'll have to have in order to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and put this way. I'm going to bring some pieces up. We're going to talk about grippers. We're going to talk about lifting. We're going to talk about drive systems and then general strategy. So I'll be right back with some pieces to show you. So let's start with gripping. In other words, being able to actually pick the piece up. So I've got here an example of our Tetrix Prime gripper. And this is actually a um, parallelogram, but um, the, the gripping points comes up and actually can can grip something just like that. And this is a basic standard type of gripper. So you can build this yourself um, out of different ways. But I want the reason I want to show you this is there's, there's two things that you can keep in mind. You can actually come from the outside and grip on the outside. But because these pieces, and this sample doesn't have them, but the pieces that the official game pieces will have locating holes, Remember that you can also, in addition to grip closing in, you can actually, if you have something inside the holes, you can spread your gripper and grip in that motion too. So that's one thing to remember. And uh, an example of that in larger scale like this is a parallelogram that I've created out of Tetrix Max pieces. And you can see that instead of the parallelogram closing this way, I've got my parallelogram on either side and it gives me a little bit different and a, a advanced range of motion. But this, again, is with the max pieces. So you could build your own style gripper with that. Or face it, if we really needed to, I mean, when we're talking about accumulating the piece, actually harvesting this, picking this up, we might decide that we don't have to grip it. We might decide that we want to use a different method. We might scoop it up like this, or we might use something like... Uh, uh, a, a vacuum uh, uh, sweeper brush that actually pushes the thing up into a hopper. There's different ways to actually accumulate the piece, and I want you to remember that. But one of the things that you might want to think about is that once you grip the piece, uh, you might want to have a wrist type of action so that the end of that gripper, uh, if this was a gripper or, or not, you're able to actually uh, change the orientation of the piece in relationship to the board. In other words, if I pick the piece up vertically like this and my board is at an angle, I might need to want to tilt that just a little bit in order to actually place it correctly on the board. Because again, once we pick it up, we have to place it as well. So keep that in mind that you might want to add a, a wrist type of action onto your gripper. So 
Again, um, just some basic ideas of things you might want to think about, strategies you might want to think about when you're actually talking about picking up the piece. So let's now talk about the next step, which is going to be lifting. So let's look at some lifting mechanisms. Okay, so let's talk lifting because one of the important things, again, we have to find the piece, we have to pick it up, and we have to elevate it to put it on the, the, the board. And hopefully, as we uh, get more advanced uh, scoring, as we continue to build lines across the board, each row will get higher, so we're going to need to lift that. The main thing that I really want to encourage everyone to think about, typically with a lifting, is they want to use a lever. So if you have to use a lever, uh, I would encourage everyone to, to be smart in the way that you use your levers and create um, either a first or second class lever. So I've got some examples of those. Let me start by showing you um, maybe a parallelogram. Again, uh, sometimes if you can make a very sturdy uh, lifting me mechanism, that's going to make your life a little easier. And in this case, because I'm using a parallelogram here, I can actually maintain the orientation of my gripper on the end so that it remains, remains parallel to my vertical mast for my, um, for my arm. The other thing is that you'll notice that again, my pivot point is here, my load is out here, and my work is back here, so this then becomes a first class lever. So this is a more efficient lever than if I just had my pivot point and my work all on the end. Uh, this is one of the things that's probably easiest to implement, but it's also most inefficient is if we put all of our pivot right here because it's a third class lever. The longer the lever, the more force it's going to take uh, to, to lift. So again, we want to make sure that we maximize and be smart in the way that we use our lifting mechanism. So this is a parallelogram. Again, I have a basic grip gripping mechanism out on the end. This one doesn't pivot, but it's something that you might consider to use. Um, let's also look at uh, a different type of maybe a more simpler mechanism where I've duplicated my servo. So and this again is basically a lifting mechanism. I don't have a gripper on the end, but as you can see, I've actually got a, my pivot point is here in the middle. I've got a servo on this side. I have another servo on this side. So I'm duplicating or doubling the power, but um, again, I have them connected with the Y so that I'm able to actually uh, synchronize those together and make sure that they're working in concert and make for, again, a little bit more power, a little bit more efficient lifting mechanism in a fairly short uh, span. So this is an idea that you might want to actually implement on your robot where that you uh, actually duplicate the power. Again, because I've got um, the, the work on either side, I'm actually a more efficient than just a third class lever. So that's an idea that you might think about. And this is the simplest of, of the three because, again, I just have a, a simple lever with, um, although it's first class because, again, my pivot and my uh, work is on this side versus the load. But, again, it's something that if we can, if you can, if you're going to use this type of lifting mechanism, that you want to make sure that you're efficient in the way that you use it. And, again, this has a simple gripper on the end of that one uh, without the wrist action. But... Uh, I would encourage everyone to, to remember that this is not the only way that you could lift. Um, there's other lifting mechanisms that you might use. A conveyor system, for instance, a belt actually can use um, be used as long as you can pick up a piece. You could use that to elevate your piece. So um, I would encourage everyone to think outside of the box, outside of the box in all of the aspects of this, um, not just the lifting mechanisms or the gripping. So. Let's go ahead and talk now about drives because this is going to be very important in, as you navigate through the game. So let's look at some different drive styles. So let's talk a minute about drive styles because one of the things that's going to be important in this game is actually navigating from the points where you pick up the piece to actually the board where you deliver it and um, the orientation at the board because it's going to be important to be able to navigate correctly at the board. So let's start with more of a traditional design like this one. And again, the idea is that we have a two-wheel drive system. Um, but the main thing that I want you to think about is the orientation of the lifting mechanism. Because if I put my lifting mechanism on this end and I'm driving in this direction, um, 
that becomes a little bit, as I swing my robot, you see that, that I have a, a radical motion on this end. It might actually make more sense if I have my lifting mechanism off of this direction so that as I make my movements with my wheels, I have a much smaller motion on this end, a little bit easier to fine tune. Or I actually could point my lifting mechanism off to the side. Again, where depending on what I have to do, because I have to navigate along the, the or traverse the, the front of that uh, scoring board, it might make more sense in the way that you orient the lifting mechanism on your drive system to be more accurate so and more adjustable uh, when it comes to being able to fine tuning it and placing that along the face of the board. So that's some things to think about when you're using a traditional drive. The other thing that I want to uh, throw out here for you is that there's other drive systems that are available that actually might work in a little bit better way, and that's something called a holonomic drive. I would encourage you to, to look online to, to find out a little bit more about that, but I'll, I'll give you kind of an example. But basically, this is a holonomic platform where I have um, three wheels, and there's four wheel designs as well as this, but this is a three wheel design, and basically each wheel is powered. Uh, it does require omni wheels because what happens is that the distance or the direction that the drive goes in is all dependent on a proportional uh, application of power to the different wheels. Basically, if I wanted to go forward or in this direction, if I would apply power in uh, equal amounts to these two wheels, then uh, depending on which direction I they spin, it's either going to uh, push itself forward this direction or forward this way. Or if I apply different amounts of powers, it might go in a different direction. So with this type of a drive, I can move in any direction at any time uh, that I need to. So if I'm approaching a board, I can go uh, straight up and then I can move laterally along the face of the board without changing the orientation of my robot, which could be very, very useful. And again, maybe going directly from there, the board back to pick up more pieces. Uh, it might be a more uh, efficient way of navigating to that. So again, I would encourage you maybe to consider if you've got the, um, the experience or, or if you want to try that, uh, perhaps a holonomic style drive as the way that you use to navigate from uh, or actually um, move the robot around the playing field. So I hope the, that gives you some ideas that maybe you can use. And when you start to plan your strategy on how you're going to uh, solve this uh, Tetra stack game. But uh, again, I would encourage you that you don't get locked into one particular uh, vein of thought. For instance, um, you might think, well, I have to pick up one piece at a time. Read the rules and make sure that you understand that don't limit yourself to just what that perception might be. Um, you might find out that, hey, I can build a mechanism that I can pick up several pieces and that way be more efficient when I move to the board and begin scoring. So those are the type of things that as a general strategy, um, again, I can't encourage you enough to think outside the box. Don't get locked into one particular way because those are gonna be some of the exciting and dynamic type of solutions that we'll see. And believe me, I'm looking forward to that this year. Every year, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to the fact that I get to go to the, the world event, and I'm looking forward to this year in Costa Rica, being able to go and see some of the exciting builds and solutions of the ARC category teams as they solve this brand new Tetra Stack game for WRO 2017. So have fun, build some robots, and we'll look forward to seeing you in Costa Rica in uh, November 2017.